Hi, TVT students. Thank you, teachers, for giving me the opportunity to share this history of the Talmud with you all. My goal today is to answer the question of why we need the Talmud itself. What is it actually doing? What brought the Talmud into being? And if I can do this, if I do this well, then you'll leave this videoed section with an understanding of why the Talmud is around and what makes it important and why because of what the Talmud does is the oral law elevated to a place that we need to look at it very, very closely and carefully. I believe if we understand this, it will set the stage for the enterprise of how we approach oral law and how we understand Talmud in general. So let's get to work. Various times I'll ask our teacher to stop the video and maybe to explain and discuss as a class before we move on. So here we go. So the story of the Mishnah and the Talmud begin with the Torah. And I know that there are, uh, that you've heard the term Mishnah and you've heard the term Talmud, but from now, at this point, I'm gonna be really careful with the terms that we use. And so I'd like you, whenever, I, whenever you understand Mishnah, Mishnah is oral law written down. But I'm not gonna call it Mishnah at this point. We'll call it Mishnah much later in the course but we're gonna call it oral law, which one at one point does get written down, and once it gets written down, the name changes from oral law to Mishnah. So, it all starts with the Torah. Here is the Torah all dressed up. Here is the Torah in, a, in its house, the, the, a, an ark. So if you walk into a synagogue or a temple or a Jewish prayer space, you'll see that there's a Torah there. If you walk into the Beit Midrash of TVT, you'll see that we have a Torah as well, and it wears a certain clothing. It wears um, jewelry on it as well to show its specialness. And here's a Torah that is unrolled. Here's someone reading a, reading a Torah. They're using a, they're not touching the Torah, so when they point to the Torah, they're using a special um, item called a yad, which is kind of a hand, but it's really your hand extension here. Here's a very brief story of the Torah. And this is a story of a God who created the world, who basically says, hey, I've created the world and I want to give my Torah, my rules for living, I want to give them to the world. So how do I go about doing that? So here is, here's God kind of looking, looking, here I created the world, who is going to take my Torah and live by it? Okay, and so here's God looking to give the Torah, and God looks and looks, and God finds Avraham and says, oh, that's the person I'm going to give the Torah to. Let's see if, if, if Avraham will follow my ways, if Avraham will accept the Torah in some way. And God finds out that Avraham does a pretty good job of following rules, so Avraham's people will eventually get my Torah. So here's Abraham. Abraham's people grow. Eventually, that group of people go down to Egypt, right? If you remember the story that Joseph is sent there first as a slave by his brothers, there's a famine, and all the other brothers come. Joseph reveals himself. I'm not just second in command of all of Egypt. I happen to be your brother. Bring everyone down. So now, all the all the Israelite people are all in one place in one time. They become slaves. And God, with the help of Moshe, frees them from slavery. They start walking in the desert. And three months later, they arrive at Mount Sinai and they get this thing called the written Torah. What is the written Torah? Well, the written Torah has the history of God creating the world, history of God finding the Jewish people, history of slavery and freedom, history of wandering in the desert, history of arriving in the promised land, rules for living a life that God wants us to live, rules for how to act with others, rules for how to serve God and say thank you. Now, I always find this kind of fascinating that the Israelites are right now in the desert for, uh, for three months, 
but in the Torah itself, it gives us a history of what happens after they get the Torah. So it has a it has forty years of history of Jewish history within the Torah itself, even though the Torah is given at Mount Sinai. So something else was written. So in some way, this Torah was still you were allowed to kind of add things or else it had predictions in it that could be read or something like that because it has a history of arriving in the promised land but of course not nothing that comes after that that's part of the bible itself the history of the jewish people inside the land of israel and how they get kicked out of that land by the babylonians in 586 bce all right so um in the torah itself right after they get the torah they um, they, it takes 40 years until they actually get to the promised land of Israel, right as they kind of are stepping into the land of Israel um, over, the, over the banks of the Jordan River, the Torah stops, and, and that's, the end of, that's the end of the Torah. So the Torah has five, five books within it, the five books of the Torah. There it is kind of unrolled. Sorry, my face is in the way here. Um, and... Um, and here are the books. They're called Bereshit, Shemot, Vayikra, Bamidbar, Devarim. Or in English, they are Genesis, they are Exodus, they have uh, um, Leviticus, Numbers, and, um, and Deuteronomy. Those are uh, a lot of Greek words there. And what are each of the pieces of Torah about? Creation of the world, God finds Jewish people, uh, 70 of them, go, uh, 70 of them, not God, down to Egypt, go down to Egypt. Israelites are now slaves in Shemot. God asks for Moses' help to free them. God gives the Torah. Israelites build in the desert a house for God. And, um, and Vayikra, or Leviticus, is all about laws for how we approach God and God's house, laws of the workers of God's house. Bamidbar is the walk in the desert that lasts not for two years, but for 40 years. And then um, Devarim is basically Moshe offers a long speech before we, the Israelites head into the land. It kind of summarizes the Torah, um, summarize, summarizes the entire, not the end, the entire Torah for the Jewish people. All right. So what is the big problem of the Torah? The big problem of the Torah is, for instance, here is the Ten Commandments. Um, here's the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments say this word, do not steal. So let us suppose that I am a Torah, um, I, that I want to follow the Torah. Let us suppose, I'm just going to turn on the light as you do. Let us suppose that I want to follow the Torah, and I want to live by the Torah in the best way possible. The question is, I have a lot of questions. For, I understand the Torah says do not steal, but what does that actually mean? So the Torah says lo tignov, do not steal, but I actually end up having a lot of questions that the Torah, sure the Torah answers don't steal, but are there questions that come up in the rule of do not steal. And I'm going to uh, turn it to you for a second of, um, if you got the rule, do not steal, what kind of questions would you still have? Meaning the Torah says something pretty explicitly, but it answers in some way a question I have, but it also raises a lot of other questions. What are those other questions? Take a little pause and see if you as a class can generate some of the questions. Welcome back. So I asked you to generate some of the questions that a commandment like do not steal brings up. Here are some that I came up with. Um, maybe you had them as well. If I steal, is it still stealing if I thought someone had thrown it away? Is it stealing if it's so inexpensive that no one would even want it? Is it stealing if it was in the lost and found for over a year? Is it stealing if the stuff that is stolen is food and if I'll die by not eating that food, is it stealing? If I am stealing from someone else who is stolen, is that considered stealing? Does it make a difference if I steal from a person versus a big corporation that often cheats me by overcharging me anyway? All right, so these are questions that the phrase do not steal do not necessarily answer. 
Um, if one of these questions particularly excites you at this moment, um, take a moment and discuss as well. We're going to do the same thing now. Welcome back with the phrase, remember Shabbat and keep it holy, also part of the Ten Commandments. Six days you will work and on the seventh day you'll rest and do no work because God rested after creating the world. So do not do all work on Shabbat. That answers certainly some questions that we might have about what we're supposed to not do on Shabbat, but it also raises a bunch of questions as well. What are the questions that this raises? Um, I would turn off this video and uh, as a class, see if you can raise a few of those questions. Welcome back. So here are some questions that I came up with that the phrase lo ta'aseh don't do all work, raises. What actually is work and what's not work? Is there one standard of work for everyone or is it profession based, right? So if I am a, if I am a carpenter, then I understand that doing work means to me um, working with wood. But if I'm a rabbi, right, maybe actually working with me, working with wood is a great hobby and is what makes me feel like, um, like I'm on vacation more than anything else. Is that, would that be considered work? Is work for one person the same thing as work for another person? Um, I may not be able to, to work, but can I ask other people to work for me? No. What if I forget? Do I get in as much trouble as if I knew it was Shabbat and worked intentionally versus I actually forgot it was Shabbat and made a mistake? If I did a really, really small amount of work, and I'm normally a mega workaholic, is that considered work? Meaning is work relative in some way? And what if someone says work or I'll kill you? Can I work or do I have to die? Um, if any of these questions um, excite you at the moment, take a little break and see if you can and discuss them as well. But really what I'm trying to bring up by all of the, by these two questions about, about, about what is work, uh, about work and stealing is that the Torah gives us rules, but those rules bring up a ton of questions. And if I want to live by the Torah, what is, a, what is eventually going to happen is that I'm going to have a lot of questions to ask about what the Torah says and what the Torah means. But we happen to be in luck because traditionally, there is this idea that not just the Torah, not just the written law was given and handed to Moshe to bring with him and the Jewish people through the desert into Israel with them. But there's also another law that was given to Moshe. And this was not a law that was written down. This was a law that was handed down mouth to ear, mouth to ear. This was an oral law, a law that was spoken, a law that was heard, and a law that was passed on, okay? And what is this oral law doing? In a way, it is answering all the questions that the Torah didn't explain. So really together, that written Torah and that oral law help to make up the answer that a Jew can ask, how do I live by the Torah? Well, of course you can't live just by the Torah, but the oral law will in some way help you understand the Torah. So Moshe here acts as a teacher. Moshe, uh, God acts as a teacher teaching Moshe, and Moshe acts as a student receiving all these laws. And soon Moshe will be the teacher teaching other people these laws as well. So for example, in the Torah, it makes it very clear that uh, a man takes a woman into his house as a wife, becomes her husband, and then he, and then, but then he writes her a bill of divorce, hands it to her, and sends her away from the house. So from the Torah, we learn this idea of a union and the breaking of that union. But that's it. That's all the Torah says about this issue. But if I want, I've got lots of questions. I want to know what a marriage ceremony looks like. I want to know what divorce looks like. Okay, the Torah brings up this concept 
of man and woman coming together, man and woman um, leaving their union, but I want to know more. And so, of course, the oral law says this is what a marriage ceremony looks like. First you do this, then you do this. This is what a divorce ceremony looks like. First you do this, then you do this. And all those laws that weren't explained in the Torah, we can call that oral law. And maybe, and if you want, you may have even heard this word before because our seventh grade Jewish studies class was all about oral law. And we had a nickname for it, which will later on in the course, we'll understand why it's called Toshba. So we have these two names right now, oral law and Toshba. Okay. So um, now it just so happens that oral, the oral law has an origin story that it understands for itself. And it's very much like the picture that I'm showing you here. Now, or I'm going to show you a bit of oral law written down because you know and that at some point in history, oral law or Toshba is written down and it gets a new name called Mishnah, right? We're going to talk about that whole idea of, of writing down oral law and the positives and benefits of the, 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 the negatives and positives of doing that. But for right now, what you need to know is if I opened up that oral law written down, which is called the Mishnah, I can find within that oral law written down called the Mishnah, the origin story of oral law. And here's how it goes. Moshe received the Torah at Mount Sinai. Moshe transmitted it to the Joshua. Joshua transmitted it to the elders. The elders transmitted it to the prophets. The prophets transmitted it to the men of the great assembly. These men said all those laws that were, it weren't explained in the Torah, and they just start kind of talking about it. So that, in a way, is the origin story. So do me a favor, and, um, and if you have a sheet like this before you, you can uh, fill it out. Or if you don't, take a piece of paper and, and, and using what's on your slide, give me the steps of the origin story of oral law. Welcome back. So you just wrote down the origin story based upon well, if you opened up the, the oral law written down called the Mishnah, you would have found this origin story and you wrote down the different steps. Now, I wonder if you noticed anything strange in the claim that oral law seems to be making, right? Did you notice anything strange in this story? Um, you could take a break and see if uh, see if any of you notice something strange. So here is what I think is very strange. It says the when it talks about the things that are being tr it's what was transmitted, 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 transmitted. The thing that's being transmitted is called Torah. But if that's the case, I thought we were talking about oral law this whole time. Why are you telling me it's Torah? If we look back at this picture, we know that there are two, that there is this Torah that was written down. And then there's this other thing called a communicative law. But all of a sudden in the origin story, we see that they're not calling this communicative law that was passed from place to place, they're actually calling this Torah as well. That to me is very strange. And in a way, when you read this, you might start thinking to yourself, oh, actually what this is talking about is how the Torah was handed, was taken by Moshe, was handed down, handed down, handed down, was given, was taken and given, taken and given, taken and given. But that's not what's happening, and the verbs almost show that that's not what's happening. What's happening is something was transmitted, and that transmitted thing, it wasn't that something was given and taken, but something was transmitted. Some group of laws was passed from hand to mouth, from mouth to ear, like this. And now they're saying, but if that's what happened, 
how are we calling that Torah 2? And that question is a really important one to help us understand the Talmud. So again, let's just, let's just discuss where we are here. So we know that the oral law is oral law. We knew that picture that at Mount Sinai, God gives something written and God gives something spoken. Okay? And that spoken thing is transmitted over generations. But all of a sudden, there's this crazy claim made that actually that oral law is also called Torah. Let's investigate further. Okay. And here is an example of why I think we might want to be suspicious. So here is a picture of Rabbi Light. And Rabbi Light is telling you that he loves making bagels, he loves eating bagels, he loves looking at bagels, he loves smearing bagels. But there's something that he's wearing that makes us feel a little suspicious of the claim that he is making. Okay? And what is that? Right? I hope you notice that there's a shirt Rabbi Light is wearing saying, I hate bagels. There's some kind of contradiction, a contradiction to what Rabbi Light is wearing and what he is saying. And that should make us question the truth here. That should make us question, is Rabbi Light either wearing the wrong shirt? Did he put it, did he not realize it was a dark when he put on the shirt in the morning? Or is Rabbi Light's statement a false statement? So here's what I mean. That kind of contradiction makes us wonder about tr the truth of Rabbi Light. Now I want you to look for a second at a typical example of Torah, which is on your left side. And then I want you to look at an example, a typical example of oral law, right? Again, this is now oral law written down, so it's called the Mishnah, but we're gonna call it oral law or Toshba right now. This happens to be actually the very first, if you open up the book of oral law, this is the very first law. And what I want you to do as a class, and you'll want to stop this video, and maybe your teachers has prepared a sheet that you can do this a little bit as um, in smaller groups first. I want you to tell me the difference between the Torah and the oral law. And I want you to tell me why it might make you suspicious when someone says, hey, this thing called oral law, this is Torah too. What makes you think that it might not be Torah? And it's going to require you to compare this with that. So take a little uh, pause from this video, do that exercise, and I'll see you in a couple minutes. Welcome back. I hope that you saw there are a few things that make us suspicious. When I read about, about the Torah, I see God talking from above. I see God saying what's going to be. I see God um, you know, giving the rules for what is, the what and the why and the how. And I see, I see Moses as just the kind of, the one who's just kind of there, kind of helping the people, but Everything is very God-based. And by the way, the word I use for God often is Hashem. Um, that's because we're not supposed to say the real name of God, so we use the name Hashem instead. But if we look at the Mishnah, if we look at oral law written down, right? But if we look at this, we're going to see something very different. We see, first of all, we see the names of actual rabbis who were certainly not around at the time of Moses and God and, and God at Mount Sinai. We see that there is disagreements. We see that there are big questions. We see that there is an attempt to answer those questions 
both though that that attempt isn't definite. There's a difference of, there's a, you know, a debate about what's the right answer. We call that in Hebrew a machloket, right? And so there's things that say, wait a second, that's a nice law about talking about this thing called the Shema. And teachers, you might want to take a, make sure that all your students understand what the Shema is and why that might be important to even be discussed at this moment. But we also see that the oral law is very different than the written Torah. And this makes us ask the question, is this really Torah too? By the way, there, this question was asked by later very famous rabbis. One is named Sadja Gaon and one is named the Rambam. And they actually came up with some interesting ideas of why actually they could justify that this actually is Torah too, right? And I wonder if you take a little break and just ask the class, um, you know, is there a way that you could call, even though you see rabbis that didn't live at the time of the Torah was given, even though you see disagreements, even though you don't see God's name in this conversation that's happening, um, is, might there be a, reason, a way that we can say actually that is Torah itself? Sajah Gaon and Rambam give an interesting explanation, but first you give it a try. Welcome back. So let's see what these guys have to say. So, so check out Rambam. Rambam says the following. He says, sorry about this. We're not getting the full. Sorry about this. OK. Um, I apologize. Okay, so um, this should say, God, what God gave to Moshe, okay, even though it's starting with Moshe, what God gave to Moshe were general ways that you can dig deeply into the Torah to find laws. And the rabbis used those strategies to uncover hidden laws that are not that had not yet been uncovered. So basically, the Rambam is saying what? He's saying God whispered into Moshe's ear. But God did not whisper into Moshe's ear every single law that was not in the written Torah. God whispered something else to Moshe. What was that? What did God whisper to Moshe? God probably whispered to Moshe, these words. Here's how to dig deeper. Here's the strategies for figuring out what is hidden in the Torah. Moshe, I'm giving you these strategies. Now get to work and apply them. So God gave Moses A, the permission to use certain strategies to dig deeper in the Torah. And God showed Moshe what those strategies were. So in a sense, every time we use those strategies and we uncover something, we're not making it up ourselves. We're uncovering what God wants us to uncover. So that could be Torah. So that's, a, that, that's an interesting idea right there that the Rambam is saying. Here's what Sajah Gaon says. Sajah Gaon says, through conversations with God, Moshe actually learns every single Jewish law that was, was important and will ever be important. But somehow this knowledge was lost. Moshe forgot it. So what is the oral law? The oral law is a great project that the rabbis engage in to recover those laws. So it's like there was an oral law. So a court, right? So there, was an, uh, there were all these laws given. And basically God said, don't forget these laws, Moshe. But Moshe forgets them. And our job is to say, we know that God gave laws. What are those laws? Now we need to figure them out. So, um, by the way, do, do, do either of those convince you that the oral law is Torah too? 
do one of those laws convince you even more than another? Sajak owns Rambam. I would stop the video and take have a discussion if you think this does. So I'm going to give you an example right now of um, of how this whole process might work, and again, why the Talmud is around in the first place. So I want to talk about one more reason why the Torah, oral Torah has such a hard time proving that it is Torah too. Even though we had these two explanations by Sajjah Gaon and the Rambam, it's still, we're having a hard time because we saw that when we compared oral law to the Torah, they just, oral law just doesn't seem like the Torah too. I have too many questions of like, really, is that really true? Are you, it seems like something that, that the rabbis are just making up maybe. Okay. Now I want you to imagine for yourself that you were given on the first week of school the student parent handbook, right? That tells you all of the rules that you need to know about how to be a student at TVT. And here it is, there's a forward from um, Miss Quigley, our head of school, kind of, uh, kind of welcoming you and telling you all the laws. Now here's Mila, the president of the ASB, who says the following. You know what? There are going to be rules that you're going to look for in the handbook that are actually not in there. You're going to, and you're going to think, oh, it wasn't written in there, so it must be allowed. But Mila is here to tell you there are a lot of rules that are not talked about in the handbook. But don't worry, I met with Miss Quigley and she transmitted everything to me that you need to know. Okay? So first of all, do we believe her? Do we believe that Mila is correct? Actually, I have three big questions that I really want to ask about this. Who is actually most threatened by Mila's claim? Number one. Two, what if Mila is wrong? Number three, how might Mila go about proving that she is correct? So stop the video and have a discussion and see if we can answer these three questions. One, who is most threatened by Mila's claim? What if Mila is wrong? And how might Mila go about proving that she is correct? Okay. So, welcome back. Here are some thoughts that I have about this. Mila is basically saying, I had a conversation, a private conversation with our head of school, and she told me all the necessary things that you need to know. If you have a question, come to me, the head of the ASB, and I'll make things very, very clear for you. So who's most threatened by that claim by Mila? Well, Mila's power certainly has gone up, but whose power has gone down? Miss Quigley's. People are not so quick to go look at the handbook and say, what did Miss Quigley write? Because they can now go and look to Mila, who is now providing answers to a lot of questions. What if Mila's wrong? What if Mila is, um, you know, what if people, or what if people are like, you know, Mila, that's not true. You're, you know, and there's a very real understanding that people could say, Mila, you're just making this up. How, how can I trust you? How can I believe you? The only thing Mila has to tell you is, you're going to have to trust me. I had a private conversation with Miss Quigley. Now, Mila can do a couple things to help out, to help her claim, right? She can say, oh, you don't believe me, let's go talk to Miss Quigley right now. You'll know that we were together. But what if Miss Quigley's off on a trip somewhere, right? And Mila doesn't have Miss Quigley around. Or she might say, oh, here, look, um, Miss Quigley, everything I'm saying, Miss Quigley signs off on. Like, uh, approve, this message was approved by, this uh, idea of Mila is approved by Miss Quigley. This is this, right. Okay, she could have done that. But suppose she didn't do that. 
Suppose, you know, she left quickly on a trip and she was going to do that, but uh, the pen ran out of ink and she was late for the airport. Okay, so Miss Quigley's gone, didn't write anything. What does Mila have at her disposal besides her own integrity, right? Besides saying, you just say, I'm going to have to trust me. What can Mila do to help prove that she is correct? The only thing Mila has is the handbook. The only thing Mila can do is to try to, anyone who questions Mila's own, you know, truthfulness, she has to go back to the, to the handbook and say, look, look what's written here in the handbook. It says this, and that's why I know that, that the rule is this. Sure, I'm not saying what's exactly in the handbook, but if you see what's in the handbook, you'll see it's very closely related based upon what I just said. So Mila has at her disposal one major thing to help her claim that she is true, and that is the parent-student handbook. And now if we start to think that that handbook equals the Torah, then we start to see how this analogy, this metaphor might help us understand what's going on here. Because here we have a claim that there are two Torahs. There is the written Torah and there's the oral law, which is Torah 2. So let's call that now oral Torah, okay? So there's the written Torah and then there's the oral Torah. But who is most threatened by the claim that this oral law is Torah 2? Okay, think about that for a second. You might want to pause the video and ask that question. And you might want to also pause and ask that question, how might the oral law writers go about proving that the oral law is Torah 2? Right. So who is it? Let's first talk about this. Who is most threatened by the claim that this is Torah 2? Here we said the person that was probably most threatened was the handbook writer, was Miss Quigley. So certainly God might be threatened by the claim that this is Torah 2 because we might be taking away the power of Hashem and elevating the power of whoever is has the power in these stories in these in this law the oral law and who is it that has the power who is named in these stories well rabbi eliezer rabbi gamliel other rabbis okay who is to threaten but there's someone also besides hashem that's threatened in this if if this is torah too and it's those people who in the torah have the most power Right now, you might think that's Moshe who has the has the all has the most power, but actually, interestingly enough, there's another group that really has the power. So, if we look at the Torah, you may have realized that we've got narrative about the creation of the world, narrative about the slaves being in Egypt, narrative about walking in the desert, and then a big speech by Moshe. But smack in the middle of the Torah is this book number three called Vayikra, which talks about all the rules for how the house of God works. Now, here's the Torah that's unrolled for a second. And again, here is here are those books. He, it just so happens that in every book of the Torah, there are about, you know, 10 different what we call parshiot, 10 different sections. And each of those sections has about five chapters of, um, of Torah, five chapters in them. So we have, you know, these different sections. So I started, at, this is Bereshit. This is the first book, second book, third book, fourth book, fifth book. Now, so here is what the Torah kind of looks like if we were to divide it up into pieces. Of this entire book of the Torah, all of these different parshiot that I've highlighted here, or everything in black, is dealing with one thing and one thing only. And that is the house of God that was built and then functions in the Torah, right? So God comes to the Israelite people 
in the desert at, at, at Mount Sinai, the people get very scared and God kind of realizes, oh, you know what, that's not the way I want to have a relationship. I want to be close to them. I want to be like a neighbor to them. Build me a house and I, my spirit will come and rest in that house. So once that is done, then that's called the Mishkan in the desert. Later on, when the Israelites go to Israel and take that Mishkan and build it into a house that's not portable because they're not traveling anymore, but in one place, that house is known as the Beit Hamikdash. That house is, right, the Beit Hamikdash was built by Shlomo, King Shlomo, King Solomon. It was destroyed in 587 by the Babylonians. It was rebuilt again by the by um, by the Israelites when they after they were in Babylonia they came back seventy years later when the Persians took over and gave them permission to return they built a second temple and you know that second temple because um, the Maccabees revolted when they saw that that the Greeks made that temple dirty that's a Beit Hamikdash number two that's destroyed in 70, 70 CE by the Romans okay. But at this point, at least in the Torah, it is called the Mishkan. It's not called the Beit HaMikdash. It's called the Mishkan, a traveling and portable house of God. Okay? This traveling portable house of God is talked about for a lot of the Torah, more than anything else. And it just doesn't just happen. There isn't just a house of God. That is run by a group of people, by Moshe's brother Aaron and all of Aaron's sons. That group of people called the Levites and called the Kohanim, right, who are all connected to Aaron, they're in charge of they're they're in charge of making sure that that Mishkan is clean, that that Mishkan is functioning. They accept presents from the people who want to come close to God. They decide what presents are acceptable, when they're acceptable, how they're acceptable, what makes them non-acceptable, what you, the things you do wrong to, you know, make good with God, things you do wrong that you can never make good with God. These people who are in charge of God's house, of keeping it functioning, keeping it clean, uh, designating who gets to come near God and who has to stay far away. That is a lot of power. That is the entire Jewish religion is revolving around this thing. So imagine that you are one of those people who's a worker in God's house. You're going to say to yourself, looking at the Torah, wow, this Torah is all about me. I am feeling pretty good. Life is great. You know, the Torah is saying, I get all the power. And that's great. But what happens if there's someone who comes along and says, sorry, actually, there's another Torah too. All of a sudden, this person right here, Aaron's sons and the priests and the Levites that, that, that emerge from, that, that are the children and grandchildren, they're feeling a little bit of pressure. So this is a little bit of a political story because this group right here actually has a name called the Sadducees. And the group that comes along to say, to remind us that there's another Torah out there called the Oral Torah, that group is called the Pharisees. And look what the Pharisees are actually going to be saying. They're going to be saying the following. Hey, Sadducees, hey, workers of, the t of, of God's temple. You may have a lot of power and influence, according to this Torah, but what you may have forgotten is two things. Number one is that there's another Torah, and that's called the Oral Law. That's Torah 2. Number two, look at the time period for a second. The time period is 70 CE. That, I told you, was when the Romans destroyed the Beit HaMikdash number two. So the Sadducees aren't just saying there's another Torah too, but they're turning to this, uh, the Pharisees aren't just saying there's another Torah too called the Toshba, called, called, uh, the, called the Oral Law or Toshba. They're also saying, hey, Mr. Sadducees, the very 
ex- I, the very house of God that you claim brought you all of this power, it's been destroyed. It's no longer even around. So we have a really interesting, interesting problem here. So now, right, the, sad, the, the Pharisees, which become actually, when we think of Judaism today, we actually think of it's actually based upon that idea of the oral law being Torah too. And interesting enough, now we can look at this, uh, 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 and now the, the, the slowly and slowly over time, when this idea of oral law being Torah too gets accepted, the Pharisees are all really excited. Now, I want to just take you 700 years later, just for a second. This is just an aside that I find fascinating, right? Because later on in history, and this is much later than the, you know, than, than this fight between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but now we have a fight between another group uh, uh, and whose head is this guy named Dav- Anan ben David. Because Anan ben David, who's living in Poland around the year 700, looks at this Judaism that says, how stoked am I? The oral law is all about me and the oral law is Torah too. And he says, "Uh uh-uh. He says, no, I don't believe you rabbis. I don't believe the oral law is Torah too. The only thing I believe in, I believe that you created that on your own just to get power. The only thing that I believe in, I, Anand bin David, and my followers believe in, is that the Torah is Torah too. Not the oral law is Torah too. The Torah is the Torah. I know that was given at Mount Sinai as a written form. Don't tell me that this oral transmitted law is Torah too. This is a fight that took place much later. These, uh, Anan bin David is a group of the Karaites, right? And they're basically trying to take power away from the, the rabbinic Judaism and the Pharisees that came before them. And they do it by rejecting oral law as Torah too. They say it's just not true. So they're kind of like, they're, they're almost like the, uh, they're almost like the grandchildren of the Sadducees, the philosophical grandchildren of the Pharisees. And then just and as a real aside, right, in the Karaites numbers in 1783, 2,400 Karaites are living in Russia, 1932, 10,000 in Russia, 2,000 outside of Russia. In present, according to their own estimates, there are 30,000 Karaites living in Israel. There's actually in Jerusalem a Karaite synagogue and 10,000 uh, of Egyptian descent living in the United States. Actually, in my morning Talmud class, one of the students after class came up to me and said, Rabbi Light, I am a Karite. And now, just one fascinating story about these Karites who basically said, we don't trust rabbinic, we don't trust you you Pharisees, we don't trust the idea that oral law is Torah too, we only trust that written Torah is Torah. And so, for us, we follow a Judaism that looks, opens the Torah and says, that's what it says, that's what we do, right? It says no light on Shabbat. There can be no light on Shabbat. It says that um, it never says that you can't mix milk and meat. Cheeseburgers are, are, are allowed as long as the meat is kosher and the cheese is kosher. So they don't, any of the laws that developed through the oral tradition, they don't buy. It's just an amazing story that I just want to bring up and ask a question about it. And then we'll get back to our real question. So Eastern Europe... The Nazi Eisengruppen during World War II, whose job it was to go into Eastern Europe to find ghettos where Jews were and just, you know, murder all of them. That was the job of the Eisengruppen Nazis during World War II. They go and they, um, and, and they murder. And then they dig mass graves, you know, and that's it. So they came into certain areas where tons of Karaites lived, okay? And they wanted to know, are these Karaites Jews? Should we murder them? Or are they not Jews? Should we spare them? And then the German, the Nazis then go ahead and they turn to three scholars, Zelig Kalmanovich, 
Meyer Balaban, and Yitzchak Shipper. And they ask them, are these Karaites Jewish? Meaning, should we be killing, murdering them too? Or are they not connected to Judaism and they're not Jewish, so we shouldn't? Now, they all give the opinion that Karaites are not Jewish of origin. And of course, there are, there, there, there are a couple answers to why, right? One could be that they were just trying to save their lives and they're willing to lie in order to save the lives of these Jews. Or they might be saying something very different. What might they be saying? They might be saying that actually to be Jewish, you actually not, not just need a written Torah, you need the oral law as well, and that needs to be elevated to a place of Torah too. And without it, you can have something that might look a little bit like to like Judaism, but in the end, it's not. I wonder what, uh, you know, I would take a pause and kind of see what, uh, what the class thinks about that claim, right? And I ask it right here. Okay. But now back to our main story here for a second. So here we have, like I told you, we've got these two different things. One that we know is Torah, and the other that we've got serious suspicion that it might not be Torah. But we have a claim that calls this Torah too. And this is exactly where the Talmud comes into play. Now remember, do you remember how Mila went ahead to claim that, I'm not making this stuff up, what I am saying is what I met with Miss Quigley and we talked about it more. And the way I can prove that was that I can open up this book called the Parent Student Handbook and I can show you where it's written this and I can show you how our, my discussion with Miss Quigley kind of was based upon that and how it's logical that what I'm telling you is true as well. So just like Mila used that technique of going to the source that is accepted and using that source to help prove her words is true, what is the, what is the oral law going to do? What's the move that oral law writers are going to do to prove that the oral law is Torah too? They're going to use the same moves as Mila. And that is where the Talmud comes in. So what is the Talmud? The Talmud is a document that is trying over and over and over again to tell us that the oral law, which when it becomes written down is called the Mishnah, is Torah too. It has the same status as Torah. It should be thought of with the same kind of holiness and sacredness. And here's how I can prove it. I can prove it by opening up the Torah, which you all accept as Torah, and showing you the support between the Torah and the oral law. That is the primary function. Now, the Talmud, of course, is more than that. But a primary, primary function of the, to of the Talmud is to make the link between Torah and oral law so I can convince you that oral law is Torah too. So here's a, so this is why, by the way, we see in probably just about every single page of the Talmud, one of these five phrases, Minahane mile, from where are these things derived? Which are asking the question, what is the Torah source of the statement that was just made? Or Minalan, from where do we know this? Meaning, and so the questioner is asking, what is the source in the Torah of the statement that was just made? Or Minahane Milta de, what is this, what is the matter that Blank just said? Again, asking what is the source of the Torah, of the Torah source of what was just said? Minayin, from where? What's the biblical source from this? Mina amina la, from where do we say it? What's this biblical source for this? All of these technical phrases are used in the Talmud when the Talmud looks to the, to the oral law and says, where does this come from? Is someone just making this up? And the job of the Talmud is to say, no, it comes from, based on a verse 
in the Torah itself. Okay, so um, this is something, by the way, called typically Talmud, which you'll have many times during the course itself, which shows you a typical aspect of Talmud. And always after it, it will ask, it will uh, get, ask you to do a certain activity, and we call that tip dancing with the typical Talmud. Okay, so again, here are some examples, right? The oral law written down says, don't stand and begin to pray unless you can do it seriously. And then the Talmud asks, Gamar will get into kind of uh, uh, what that term means, but the Talmud asks, asks, Amar Rav Eliezer, de Amar Kra, Vihi Marat, Minaha Neimile. Where is the biblical source for this idea? And then uh, Rabbi Eliezer comes back because the Torah says, and it gives a verse. Example number two, our rabbis taught the first day of the month of Nisan is the new year for counting the month of the years. And then it says, Minalan, from where do we find the Torah source for that? Right, you've made a statement, that statement comes from the mission itself, but where, where does it come from in the Torah? Did you just make that up or is it in the, ah, it is, there's a source for it in the Torah. Next, Minayin Lesika Shehi Kishtiya Biyom HaKippurim. How do we know that putting on perfume has the same prohibition as drinking on Yom Kippur? Shinemar, as it says in the Torah, so it's Minayin is, where do we know it? Oh, Shinemar, it says in the Torah, and it gives a quote. So these are just examples of how these terms are used. So here I'd like you to do a little activity, and here's how it goes. Find a verse from the Torah, and that verse will serve as your answer or a proof text when one of the four phrases or five phrases above are being used. So here are the five phrases. And then you're going to make up a pretend statement from the oral law written down, which we're going to call the Mishnah, in which someone would ask the question, where does that come from? So then you can answer it with, oh, it comes from the Torah. And then you can list your Torah verse. Okay, so here's, here's an example of how it will work. So here's my Torah verse that I found first, and I would go about actually doing this all this way. First, find your Torah verse, and we're, I'm going to go through how you find a Torah verse on Sepharia in one second. Right, my Torah verse is, in the beginning, Hashem created the heaven and the earth. Then I'm using one of these five phrases above, five, not four, sorry, and I'll use from where these things derive. And then here is my pretend statement from the oral law. When painting a room, always paint the ceiling first and then paint everything else. All right, so this is really how it's going to work, how it's going to look when you're, this was kind of my planning sheet, and here is my, um, my final, right? So we're going to make, uh, making up this, this, this oral law, I just made it up, right? When painting a room, always paint the ceiling first and then paint everything else. That's the, the, the Jewish law doesn't say that, but I'm just making it up. Mina hane mile. Did you just make that up? Where did that come from? Then it says, as it says in the Torah, in the beginning, Hashem created the heavens and the earth. Oh, okay, because the Torah says, when you begin, when, when God created, God started with the top and then went to the bottom. And that's why I know that the, that's why I know when painting a room, always paint from the ceiling first and then paint everything else. So again, here's how I would do this, by the way. Kind of find your verse in the Torah and say, hmm, what could be an oral law that would, what could be an oral, a, a, a made up law that would use that verse that could use that verse as its proof text, as showing that that's actually correct. Then I find one of these words, doesn't matter which one, and then I make up my, and then, um, and then I make up my law, uh, which will be answered by this proof text, by the piece of the Torah. Okay, so in order to do this, obviously you need to know how to find a piece of Torah text, and here's the way to do it. So um, you need to, you, you can use Safaria. So if you go on to Safaria, go say safari.org, you'll probably come up with this. Click on that. You'll come up with a page that looks like this. Um, if you go to, you're going to click on the word Tanakh, and, it, and that will take you to, Tanakh means Bible in Hebrew, and that will take you to either five books of Torah and other stuff. But you're going to click on one of these, and so let's just click, pretend we're clicking on Genesis. Um, the first book of Torah, it'll give you all the different chapters. You can click on one of these chapters and find stuff written in Hebrew. So I'm going to click on chapter one, and chapter one takes me here. Um, I can go up here to change if I want it all in English or all in Hebrew, whatever I want. But this is how I can kind of find my verse, and that's the one I picked right here. Um, 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 
when God, uh, God created heaven and earth, right? So heaven first, and that's what I use as my proof text. So you, again, you can use any chapter, you can use any book of Torah to find your verse in order to kind of do this activity. Okay, um, so uh, take a break and come back to the video when you're done, maybe share, have some people share what their answers were and how they did this. Okay, um, and my final piece before I end this video is that there is one implication for claiming that oral Torah is oral Torah. And if you remember how you probably looked at a poem um, called um, like written in a sealed cattle car or written in a sealed box car um, by Dan Pagus. And we asked you the question of what does it look like? What does it mean? What does it look like to read poetry? How do you read poetry? And we were asking the larger question, what does it mean to read Torah like poetry? And so one key thing to know is when we know something is poetry, we read it in a very different type of way. Let me just give you an example of this right here. Um, so here is a refrigerator and here's a note on that refrigerator. Let's get a little closer to what that note says. Oh, it says, I've eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were so delicious, so sweet and so cold. So I wanna uh, maybe pause for a second after I ask these questions. Who wrote this poem? Oh. Who wrote this note? And what does it mean? Who wrote this note? And um, why was it written? And a person who just kind of moseys on over to the, um, to the fridge, what are they thinking? And I, I, I may have given it away already, so I'll kind of keep on going here. Um, but um, the person who looks at this says, hmm, either this note was written because the, so the buyer of the plums are not surprised when they open up the fridge and they find that there are no plums there. Or maybe it's written as a note to the person who's the buyer of the plums to say, time to buy more plums. We don't have any left. Sorry, I ate them. Um, maybe it was about just saying, you know, I just want to express my apology. But imagine now that we put a title to this note on the fridge called, this is just to say, and imagine we put a cover page on this and put it with a lot of other, other notes in the fridge called The Collective Poems of William Carlos Williams, Volume 1. And suppose we knew a little something about Williams Carlos Williams, that he won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, was a United States Poet Laureate, um, was a National Book Award winner for Poetry. All of a sudden, we're not reading a throwaway note on the fridge that I can take it off and throw it out. We're reading a poem by a famous poet who has won major awards. And we look at this poem, at this, at this note on the fridge very differently. We say to ourselves, oh my goodness, this is not just a throwaway note on the fridge. This is something I'm supposed to learn from about life. This is, this po this, 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 these words, have real meaning to them that I need to really dig into deep. So what happens when we now take something called oral law and say that was not written by the rabbis? This comes from God. All of a sudden, we need to start taking each and every word, what's written and what's not written, why it says it this way and why it doesn't say it this way, very, very seriously. If you remember, the way our approach to Torah is, is that God is not a blabbermouth. God writes every word with intention. God leaves out specific words with intention. And our job is to dig and to understand why. But now all of a sudden, if we are, that was our approach to Torah. And that's what you're going to be doing when you look at Rashi each and every week. You're going to kind of learn 
how does a Jewish, how, what is the Jewish approach to Torah all about? What does textual analysis from a Jewish point of view, um, what does that look like? And I believe actually it's going to help you when you go to your English classes and when you go to your classes where you're asked to do a lot of, a, a lot of textual analysis. And it's a reason why if you go to the greatest law schools in the United States, you're going to find a lot of people wearing a kippah because uh, people who have been raised understanding through Rashi, the Jewish way of asking questions and analyzing texts, they become great text analyzers in other realms as well. But back to my story, if we raise now the oral law to a place where we're calling it not oral law, but oral Torah, if we're calling it Torah from the mouth, Torah Sheba Peh, or Toshba for short, all of a sudden, by saying it's Torah, we have to apply the same idea of God is not a blabbermouth to this as well. And we have to look at each and every word and why and what and how and, and when. And so it changes our approach to how we look at the Mishnah itself, which is the oral law written down. So as a summary of this entire history unit, what I wanted to show you today was why Talmud came about what the big problem Talmud is here to solve. The big problem is, is, is this oral law really Torah too? The Talmud comes about to say, yes, it is, and I can prove it. I can prove it by linking it back to the Torah itself. And the second outgrowth of this is that once we elevate this piece of uh, this oral law to the status of Torah, we need to approach it and look at it with the same analytical strategies that we use when looking at Torah. So as you learn those analytical strategies through your daily encounter with Rashi and the Torah, you'll say, oh, those how are going to be, I'm going to see those same analytical strategies being used in the Talmud itself. Thanks, everyone.